Well, thank you uh, to the scientific committee, uh, I guess to myself for inviting myself. <laughs> so, uh, appreciate it. Great weather. So today I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the tetravalent vaccination strategy. Of course, uh, we can't talk about dengue vaccines without talking about Sanofi Pasteur CYD TDV vaccine. Uh, Chris will obviously give more details about uh, some of the data. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of CYD TDV for second generation vaccines. And then I'm going to briefly go through the dengue vaccine pipeline in human trials. Uh, of course, there's more in discovery and uh, preclinical. Uh, and then I'll just uh, give a quick update of the status of uh, a couple of the uh, uh, current uh, second generation vaccines. And then touch on some other questions. So uh, I'll just say that uh, the global dengue burden trend is alarming. It's one of the few infectious diseases that has had increasing mortality trend uh, between 2005 and 2015, according to this uh, uh, couple years ago, the Stanaway uh, uh, study. Uh, the good news is that vaccine we know is feasible because infection, uh, natural infection con confers long-term protection against disease with the same serotype, so-called homotypic uh, immunity. And then there's uh, short-term heterotypic protection against other serotypes that has varying duration, maybe two months to three years. And then we also know that uh, sequential uh, natural infection uh, may confer protection against severe disease by uh, other serotypes. And we kind of deduce this based on the fact that we don't see many DHF or severe dengue cases from known third or fourth infections. Uh, and that uh, third or fourth infections in at least one study is more likely to be subclinical than symptomatic. But of course, major challenges exist, and that's why we're having all the, this conversation about dengue vaccine. Uh, and it's mainly due to the existence of these four stereotypes that can interact with each other in not very clear ways at times. So it can result in protection, uh, long-term protection, or partial and or temporary protection. And of course, it can lead to enhancement. Uh, and that can be due uh, to a suboptimal or waning immune response uh, that could potentially enhance subsequent natural infection. And then the four serotypes in the context of uh, live vaccine anyway can uh, lead to interference. So again, the four serotypes uh, can interact and, and complicate this whole situation. So this has led to the, uh, to the general strategy for vaccination development uh, of simultaneous, simultaneous tetravalent homotypic immunity, or trying to elicit that. Uh, but we always have to keep in mind that that's not the same as uh, immunity from sequential natural infections. So uh, Sanofi Pasteur CYD TDV or Dengvaxia is trademark, uh, is a tetravalent uh, vaccine that uh, uh, contains uh, four chimeras with yellow fever 17P backbone and then the pre M and E uh, structural proteins from uh, the four different serotypes. Uh, it's been tested in more than 35,000 children in, in 10 countries in Asia and Latin America in uh, field efficacy trials. And so here's just a one slide summary of uh, the results up until last year. So uh, we knew that there were serotype specific differences in efficacy uh, so that it had poor efficacy against dengue 2, moderate efficacy against dengue 1, uh, and good efficacy against dengue 3 and 4. Uh, and that was in despite the fact that there was a balanced neutralizing antibody responses uh, by PRNT after the third dose and balanced to all the four serotypes. Uh, so this brought up the notion of what the relevance of these neutralizing antibody titers were um, as measured in, uh, uh, by uh, Sanofi. Uh, subsequently, there was a, a deeper analysis of the uh, neutralizing antibody titers uh, in relation to the clinical outcomes and vaccinees with higher month 13 titers to a particular serotype did have lower risk of symptomatic dengue from that serotype and the hazard ratio um, uh, from this paper from Moody et al. from uh, uh, beginning of this year uh, was uh, 0.19 to 0.43 per tenfold increase in titer. So there again was increasing protection with higher titers. 
but this was not really a clear cutoff or anything like that. Uh, and you could have very low titer and still be protected or not, uh, not have uh, the risk. So uh, this was, there was a relationship, it just was not clear. So neutralizing antibodies as measured there are crude markers. They're not, not associated, but they're quite crude. Uh, the other uh, summary is that there was poor efficacy in very young children, and of course, the seronegatives had uh, poor efficacy, and these were not uh, independent, the age and the seronegative status. Uh, there was higher efficacy against severe and hospitalized dengue. Um, and then uh, the thing that uh, uh, was alarming uh, from a couple of years ago was this elevated risk of hospitalized dengue in the two to five-year-olds in year three. Uh, now, subsequently, the risk uh, decreased in years four and five, so it was really uh, highest during that year three in this age group. And then at the time, it was not consistently seen in older age groups, and specifically in the, in the, in the eventual license, licensure age of greater than nine. Uh, but uh, that uh, situation was somewhat, uh, um, uh, was unclear because the number of seronegatives in the older subjects uh, based on the immunogenicity, uh, the immuno subset was quite low. So there's just few numbers in which to base uh, any clear conclusions on in the older age group. Now, subsequently, because of the theoretical risks and seronegatives, uh, there was a post hoc analysis based on serostatus. And uh, that was based on this uh, new testing that was uh, dengue anti NS1 IgG ELISAs. And those were applied to month 13 samples from those phase 2B and 3 trials. And that was used to infer the baseline dengue zero status uh, on more uh, subjects than just were actually tested directly uh, within their, the original immuno subset. So uh, based on that post hoc analysis, in zero negatives, uh, the cumulative five year incidence of hospitalized dengue in the two to 16 year olds, and so that was again, the whole age range from uh, the very young to the, uh, the, the older uh, adolescents, uh, it, it was a 3% um, incidence of hospitalized dengue cumulatively in the vaccine recipients versus 1.87 in the controls with a hazard ratio of 1.75. So again, cumulatively, there was an incre increased risk with this whole age group of um, uh, hospitalized dengue. And then if you focus just on the nine to 16 year olds, uh, which is the indicated age uh, during licensure, uh, it was less, the hazard ratio is 1.41, and in fact, uh, it actually um, uh, was, um, uh, the lower confidence interval was less than one. So again, this was uh, results that uh, was available to the WHO SAGE uh, uh, committee, um, but uh, just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, in the New England Journal. Now, that's cumulative, but uh, the actual time after vaccination, the risk is, is not the same. So this was the KM curve for the two to eight year olds. So this is the youngest age group that would, was not in the li indicated licensure age. Uh, and they're the ones that had the actual year three risk that appeared during the original analysis. So uh, if you look just at, uh, focus on the blue solid and dotted lines. Uh, the vaccinated seronegatives are the dotted blue, the unvaccinated seronegatives are the solid blue. And uh, you can kind of look at the trends uh, up until about 21, 22, 23 months, uh, there really isn't much difference, meaning that there was not really any benefit or risk from vaccination in these seronegatives in this very young age group. Uh, but then at around 21 to 23 months, there uh, seems to be a higher risk trend in the vaccinated seronegatives, which kind of continues uh, for the course of this follow-up. Uh, it's the, it stops at 66 months, so we don't necessarily know what's gonna happen after 66 months, but there's the trend. Now we should also say that for the red uh, lines, that there is efficacy uh, to the vaccine in the seropositive. So the red dotted and solid lines indicate seropositive uh, efficacy, and so there was efficacy. So you can see there's a dramatic difference, actually. Now this is in the youngest age group. Now this is in the nine to 16-year-olds, and again, it's the same colors. So vaccinated seronegatives are the dotted blue, unvaccinated seronegatives are the solid blue. 
So there was maybe some, uh, if you just eyeball it even, there's some efficacy until about 18 to 20 months, and then the slopes change a bit, and then they ultimately cross at 30 months, indicating that at 30 months, the cumulative risk in vaccinated seronegatives uh, of hospitalized dengue was higher. So uh, it really, you know, cumulatively switches at 30 months, and then it continues on. Uh, and again, beyond 66 months, not clear. We should, again, as with the other uh, graph, note that uh, the uh, seropositives, the efficacy there, uh, there was a benefit in terms of uh, uh, the uh, efficacy uh, among the seropositives in this uh, older age group. Now, so the overall situation is comparable in the two to eight year olds and the 19, si nine to 16 year olds, just it's more uh, dramatic, more obvious in the, uh, uh, the youngest age group. So uh, based on a lot of this information, the WHO SAGE uh, made a recommendation in April, and Annalise will discuss that in much more detail uh, when she uh, talks. The new information uh, was that in the, nine, in the older than nine-year-olds, nine and older, that uh, the seropositive partici participants and the seronegative participants had quite a big difference in uh, the, uh, their uh, efficacy. It was 76% in the seropositives, in the older seropositives, and 38, 39% in the, uh, <coughs> uh, oh, I mixed that up. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, sero the seropositive participants who were over nine years old had 76%, and then there was seronegative greater than nine-year-olds had 39%. So again, in this older age group, the uh, serostatus made quite a difference. Uh, and then the, the risk of hospitalized dengue was increased, and the risk of severe dengue was also increased in those seronegatives that were older than nine years old. And that started, as you kind of saw in the graph, uh, at about 30 months in terms of the cumulative increased risk. So based on this new information, uh, the WHO SAGE made the recommendation that pre-vaccination screening strategy mm -hmm. would be the preferred option. Uh, and with that, only seropositives should be vaccinated. Uh, and of course, with that recommendation, developing an accurate point of care assay for dengue serous status would be a priority. Uh, but even with all of this, uh, no assay really can be 100% specific. So. Uh, no matter what assay is used, there has to be some acceptance of the fact that some truly seronegative individuals may be vaccina vaccinated. Now, with all of this information, even from the original WHO SAGE recommendation from 2016 until the revision uh, in April, uh, there was a recognition that the overall population level benefit of vaccination remained favorable in high transmission settings. So even in the most recent revision, in areas where uh, the dengue seroprevalence uh, was 70%, uh, the overall benefit uh, over a five-year period was that there are four severe cases prevented in seropositives uh, for every one excess severe case in seronegatives per 1,000 vaccinees. So if you take seronegatives and seropositives together, there is still an overall public health benefit uh, in high transmission settings. Uh, and in general, vaccines that have moderate efficacy may have high higher public impact, uh, especially for diseases that have high burden, severity, or economic costs, that cause frequent outbreaks, that disrupt uh, health care systems and cause political instability. So there are other factors also that, um, uh, for which uh, moderately effective vac vaccines uh, can actually provide benefit. And of course, dengue has some of these characteristics. But it's not really that calculus that has uh, caused the issues with uh, uh, dengvaxia. It's really the safety concerns uh, and the discussion around the safety concerns that have uh, been true hurdle to implementation. And in terms of that, after what, two years uh, of licensure in a lot of dengue endemic countries, it's only been implemented uh, in two countries and and uh, in subnational programs in those two countries. So this was a, an article that, that uh, a perspectives article that came with the New England Journal uh, article uh, that uh, from a couple of weeks ago that uh, presented the Sanofi uh, inferred results. Uh, 
Uh, and there's this term trolleyology, which I, I thought was interesting. I hadn't heard too much about before, and I think maybe others might, might mention that because it's quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, and that uh, if you had a choice uh, uh, in a situation where there's some trolley that's about to uh, hit five people and you can switch the tracks and uh, in the switched track, there's one person that you would essentially kill. Uh, in that situation, what you would do versus if uh, you were on a bridge over that same trolley and uh, y there's some guy standing next to you and you could push that guy in front of the train to stop the train and save those five people, is there a real difference? Well, ultimately there really isn't. Uh, somebody dies, one person dies and you save five people. But uh, uh, just conceptually and emotionally, uh, it's, un it's much less acceptable to push someone uh, you know, off of the bridge to stop that trolley. Now, I would say that it depends on the person, perhaps, <laughs> when, you're, when you're making this judgment. But for most people, you know, you, you would have a problem pushing them off. So this is the idea of utilitarianism to maximize benefit, minimize harm versus intentional harm that you know is going to happen directly. Uh, and I th there was a good quote from this, uh, this article that said, and this was in the context of self-driving cars, that regulating for utilitarian algorithms may paradoxically increase casualties by postponing the adoption of a safer technology in that for self-driving cars, even though probably it's safer, the fact that people don't have control, that creates some difficulty just in terms of accepting that. Uh, and forcing that may actually cause a, uh, uh, a reaction that maybe is negative for the overall implementation of those self-driving cars. And so perhaps this is a, a somewhat parallel situation with uh, vaccines where the overall benefit of pub in, pub in terms of public health uh, may be there uh, but there uh, may be resistance, and in the Philippines, I think this is uh, going on right now. There's this very emotional reaction in the Philippines to uh, uh, the situation there it, that doesn't really reflect the overall public health situation if you take it from a utilitarian standpoint. Uh, I'm going to very quickly go through the possible reasons for the CYD performance or the mixed performance. Uh, there's talk about interference after the first dose in dengue-naive people. Uh, there was balanced uh, PRNTs after uh, three doses, but it wasn't balanced after the first dose. There was, so there was the thought that uh, Dengue 4 was essentially immu immunodominant. Um, and then there's a question about uh, whether the formulation was actually um, uh, correct if it was guided by the PRNTs that were used. So perhaps the relative serotype formulations were not appropriate. Uh, and then uh, the idea that uh, that the in seronegatives, in dengue naive people, that the vaccination served as a primary like infection, artificially administered, uh, leading to the first real natural infection becoming more secondary like, and of course, secondary infections are more likely to be severe. So this was uh, a, a working theory uh, that makes sense. Uh, it does imply, however, that the CYD TDV behaves like a monovalent dengue vaccine, and Presumably, it would be due to interference, uh, as mentioned in the first bullet. Uh, there's also the idea that uh, the T cell responses were maybe important and were not elicited because uh, the T cell responses are mostly to non-structural proteins and uh, the uh, CYDTV non-structural protein is yellow fever. Uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, the relevant, relevant epitopes were a little bit different in natural versus uh, CYD. So the implications and lessons for second generation vaccines have uh, in uh, large part really been taken up already by the second generation vaccines. But uh, one of them uh, revolves around this, uh, what kind of immunity you're inducing. So are you inducing long-term homotypic immunity, similar to what you would be inducing with the uh, same serotype homotypic uh, uh, immune response in natural infection? So long-term homotypic immunity versus transient versus long-term heterotypic immune responses. So in that context, as I mentioned, for live vaccines, interference can lead to homotypic versus heterotypic Im immune responses to different serotypes. Uh, and so what uh, this really means is that in the evaluation development of vaccines, uh, especially in terms of the potential for interference, uh, in live vaccines anyways, that uh, the infectivity of the vaccine serotype component uh, would 
it would be good to assess them early in clinical studies. And then uh, also given this uh, mix of potentially long-term and short-term uh, immunity, the duration of protection and or risk uh, needs to be assessed. And, and for that reason, some type of surveillance active uh, for both symptomatic and severe disease should be extended for a certain period of time. How long the optimal time is is a matter of discussion, but perhaps one season or one year is not sufficient since a lot of that might simply be heterotypic transient uh, immunity. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the serostatus that we talked about uh, before vaccination may be critical, so pre-vaccination blood samples should be collected from, uh, if not all, uh, a lot of, uh, of the vaccine um, trial participants. And then analysis uh, should be done by serostatus. Uh, and then the idea about the neutralization assays that have traditionally been used, uh, those are probably not totally unrelated, but they're quite crude measures of clinically relevant <coughs> outcomes. So other markers uh, that reflect uh, the longer term uh, versus shorter term or transient type of immune responses uh, should be uh, investigated. And in the mix of that is evaluation um, and the importance potentially of uh, conformational epitopes that have uh, been discussed over the past uh, recent past quite a bit. Uh, and then because there could be changes in this uh, level of immunity that there should be assessments at different time points after vaccination. And then I've already mentioned the importance or potential importance of uh, cell mediated immunity. Uh, and so that should be at least considered. Uh, and overall, uh, the pursuit of uh, immune correlates uh, is uh, perhaps become a lot more relevant right now than it was five or six years ago when the expectation was that the vaccine trial uh, would simply be uh, uh, produce good results uh, and fairly straightforward good results. Uh, and then no matter what, at this point anyways, clinical efficacy trials for licensure is probably necessary for whatever new vaccine does occur. Uh, but uh, the importance of control infection models for proof of concept and down selection of, uh, of vaccine candidates uh, takes on greater importance. And then in the even longer term, other vaccine design approaches uh, are certainly worth pursuing that might avoid some of the issues that have come up uh, uh, based on the lessons from the Sanofi vaccine. So this is the uh, human dengue vaccine pipeline uh, in human trials. And uh, I listed them here. The, the first three are the live attenuated uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, dengue vaccine, actually, it's, it's not really in human trials. It's already been licensed. Uh, and then Takeda and uh, the NIH-developed uh, vaccine. Uh, the uh, Takeda one is uh, three chimeras and one uh, mutated. The one mutated is uh, uh, dengue two. The other chimeras are dengue two backbone with uh, the structural proteins of the uh, other serotypes one, th uh, three, and four. And then the NIH uh, vaccine, which uh, is the reverse in that it has one chimera and three uh, uh, mutated uh, uh, components. Uh, the one chimera is uh, for dengue two, where the dengue two component has a dengue four backbone and the structural PRM and uh, uh, E components of Dengue 2. So I should also mention that the NIH vaccine has uh, multiple licensees, uh, manufacturers, who, uh, which are developing, uh, actively developing the vaccine, and the most notably, uh, Butantan from, from Brazil has progressed uh, quite a bit on that, and I'll give a very brief update on uh, their status. I'm sure uh, Alice could give a much better update, but I think I'm uh, sitting in at least temporarily <laughs> uh, for him briefly. Uh, and then there's the, the other candidates. So there's uh, GS GSK, uh, uh, US Army, Fiocruz, uh, inactivated uh, whole virus. Uh, and then Merck has a subunit, uh, E, and USA Navy has DNA. And then there's a US Army heterologous prime boost uh, study that uh, had been occurring. Uh, using their inactivated whole virus and uh, a classically attenuated live virus uh, candidate. So CYDTDV has been registered. Uh, the Butantan uh, vaccine that's uh, developed from uh, the NIH vaccine uh, is in phase three, and the TDV from Takeda is in phase three. And then the um, 
uh, others are essentially in phase one or phase two. And the others have uh, essentially stalled because of a lot of the, uh, the potential risks uh, that have uh, come up with the current dengue vaccine conversation. <coughs> so I mentioned that the two live attenuated vaccines are in phase three, and uh, I've already sort of briefly mentioned a little bit of the differences. Uh, the TV003, TV005 uh, vaccine developed by the US NIH, uh, that has undergone extensive studies in phase one and phase two trials now, including uh, controlled human infection studies. Uh, it elicits transient viremia in most subjects, and for all four serotypes, there's uh, typically no boost observed when uh, a second dose is given, suggesting that there might be uh, sufficient immune response from the first dose. Uh, there was uh, encouragement uh, based on the use of TV003 in a human infection model study uh, in which the TV tetravalent TV003 uh, was provided to uh, recipients uh, and compared with uh, placebo recipients. And essentially, uh, after six month post vaccine uh, challenge, none of the vaccine recipients uh, had viremia from this challenge strain of dengue 2 uh, versus all of the placebo recipients developing viremia. So it essentially provided at least 100% protection in this uh, study uh, from, uh, from uh, challenge with this uh, attenuated challenge strain. And so as mentioned, Utantan DV is the name of the, uh, of the TV003 equivalent uh, vaccine. It's a live flies product uh, that uh, Utantan has manufactured. And they uh, started their phase two trial a couple of years ago uh, at multiple sites in Brazil. Uh, it's a single dose. So again, that's uh, important uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the age grouping uh, is two to 59 years old and uh, almost 17,000 uh, in their study population. Uh, the results, uh, as was mentioned yesterday, has, have been delayed uh, because, or at least the preliminary results have been delayed because of the low incidence of dengue in Brazil over the past couple of seasons. So uh, by now, uh, if there had been a fair number of uh, dengue cases, then there might have been some preliminary results to actually mention. But it seems like that's going to be delayed until, uh, who knows? I just said late 2019 because <laughs> that's, that's what I think uh, or hope might happen. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, the Takeda vaccine, uh, as mentioned, is uh, uh, three out of four uh, are chimeras and one is um, attenuated. Uh, dengue 2 is the attenuated uh, strain, and so there was concerns about whether that would be potentially dominant uh, when four, four vaccines, uh, four components were given. Uh, and so that led to a, a decrease in the dengue 2 component for later trials. Um, and specifically, the most recent trial uh, was this uh, randomized phase 2 trial that used this new component with the decreased dengue 2 formulation. Uh, that was uh, uh, given in 1,800 subjects aged 2 to 17 years old. Uh, that was given as one or two doses separated by three or 12 months. Uh, it was uh, uh, done in three countries, one in uh, Asia and two in Latin America uh, or the Caribbean. And the preliminary results from earlier this year, you know, there was obviously immunogenicity uh, results that were presented. Uh, and then they actually had enough uh, preliminary results of dengue cases uh, to have, uh, they couldn't call it efficacy because that's not what it was designed for, but uh, the percent of virologic confirmed dengue cases uh, was s significantly lower in the vaccinees than in the controls during that 18 month study period among the 1800 subjects. So uh, specifically 1.3% in the vaccinees and 4.5% in the controls. No further subgroup analysis in terms of serotypes, et cetera, et cetera, and this was sort of uh, early on. So this could be the equivalent of uh, the SNOFI first 25 months or so. So it's hard to know uh, exactly uh, whether to be totally encouraged by this or not, but certainly you can't conclude too much. But I would say that there's potentially some uh, benefit, at least in this very narrow type of uh, situation. And 
the phase three from Takeda will be the uh, determinant uh, for whether this uh, pans out. So the phase three by Takeda started also a couple years ago enrolling uh, in multiple countries, and you can see the countries listed there. Uh, the age range was four to 16, and uh, that's 20,000 uh, people, so it's quite a large study. And for this study, uh, since it's spread out over multiple countries, there is sufficient attack rate in certain countries to give uh, some results, which I think are expected in early 2019. So in the not too distant future, there'll be some preliminary efficacy results coming out of this uh, Takeda phase three uh, trial. Uh, I want to just sort of mention a, a couple of other questions, not because they are definitive, but just because there's lots of other questions. So the idea of whether in the strategy of tetravalent homotypic uh, 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 strategy for immunization using this tetravalent formulations, whether all four serotype compo components are needed uh, to provide protections against all four serotypes. Uh, and this is really the equivalent of asking whether uh, in the natural setting in which sequential natural infections um, may provide cross-protective immunity from severe disease against other serotypes, whether there's a sort of equivalent situation if you give uh, multiple uh, serotypes uh, simultaneously as you do with tetravalent vaccination. So this was evaluated um, by uh, Steve Whitehead and Anna, uh, Anna uh, and I just took this off of the, uh, the abstract that uh, was published in the ASTMH um, in which they presented this. So some of you might have seen their presentation and I think they presented subsequently. Uh, but basically compared to what I mentioned before where there was 100% pr uh, uh, protection against the challenge strain that was used uh, after TV003 vaccination, that in this situation where they gave basically three uh, uh, serotypes, dengue 1, 3, and 4, and then challenged with a dengue 2, uh, that there was not that same level of protection by any means. And uh, so the, the actual numbers, I think, were not in the abstract, uh, but they were substantially lower in terms of protection against viremia and protection against dengue boost, dengue neutralizing antibody boost by that challenge strain. Uh, so it looks like uh, simultaneous trivalent vaccination is not going to protect you from the fourth strain, at least in this controlled human infection model. Um, but uh, again, this is suggestive of uh, that uh, this may not, uh, that uh, four uh, serotypes will be needed for uh, uh, other vaccines. But again, since this is uh, the human infection model that was used, uh, with uh, somewhat of an attenuated challenge strain. You'd have to take it with that grain of salt, but suggestive that you might need all four serotypes. Uh, and then I'll mention one other thing, which is uh, the antibodies associated with risk and protection. Uh, this was mentioned uh, yesterday by uh, Mauricio in his, uh, his talk. This was he Eva Harris's study uh, of uh, her pediatric cohort in Nicaragua, uh, and there was multiple years, over a decade of, uh, of uh, data uh, and uh, inhibition ELISA binding antibodies were measured. And so based on that uh, evaluation of those multiple years of this cohort, that seems like there was uh, uh, different clinical risk depending on the level of the binding pre-existing uh, anti-dengue uh, virus antibodies based on this inhibition ELISA. So that if you had an ELISA titer of 1 to 21 to 1 to 80, then you had a sevenfold higher risk uh, of uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome. But if you had higher than that or lower than that, then your risk was, was lower. So in other words, the binding antibodies as measured by that uh, assay was associated with both clinical risk and protection depending on the level. Um, I don't, so there was some suggestion that there might be some mechanistic mm. aspect to this, but I'm not sure that that really is the case. You can say that there's an association, uh, but uh, I think uh, beyond that, uh, uh, there should be limited uh, uh, conclusions that you can make from that. But in any case, this is uh, analysis of the data. Now just uh, the last month, uh, there was uh, another study that used the long-term pediatric school-based cohorts in Thailand, in Northern Thailand, that's run by uh, the US Army. 
And uh, in those uh, cohorts, the assays were HIs and in subsets, uh, PR and Ts. So this was not the inhibition ELISA, it's uh, different uh, ELISAs. But in this evaluation, it also showed that uh, HI titers of less than 1 to 40 had a seven times greater risk uh, of, uh, uh, of BHF. Uh, and then if you had higher titers or zero titers, that the risk was, was low or zero, essentially. And in terms of PRNT titers, there was a similar type of uh, uh, association in that PRNT titers of less than 1 to 100 had about seven times greater risk of BHF. But if it's higher or zero or, or lower, then the risk was, was low. In both Eva Harris's study and this study, um, the, uh, the risk was seen with BHF uh, and more severe dengue. It was not seen with uh, regular symptomatic dengue. So again, this is an association. There's no mechanistic, mechanistic types of uh, conclusions from, from these studies. It just suggests that antibodies have some relevance in these natural cohort studies. Uh, I think that the epidemiologic background also probably is going to be different. The assays used uh, and the levels used are going to be different. So I think uh, it's risky to try to uh, have specific titers uh, as conclusions for what is or is not at risk. I mentioned the pursuit of immune correlates has become more important because of this overall situation. Uh, and I would say that on, from a positive standpoint, compared to about five years ago, there's more clinically relevant data and samples on which to uh, base uh, this pursuit of immune correlates. So there's lots of now multi-year natural correlates, uh, cohort studies. I shouldn't say lots. There's a few that are very well characterized. Uh, and then there's uh, certain studies that involve dengue vaccines with clinical endpoints that also can be uh, evaluated. So uh, the Sanofi's phase 2B and 3 trials, obviously those uh, have clinically relevant samples. Uh, a limitation is that uh, they do have this uh, smaller immunosubset of about 4,000, which has pre-vaccination serum. Uh, there's also uh, an NIH PO1 uh, uh, study uh, in which Alan Rothman is the PI that uh, actually piggybacked on one of the uh, sites in the Philippines. Uh, and so there's uh, cells and other uh, uh, differences that, uh, that are ancillary and in augmenting the Sanofi trial there. And one of the most important things is that that group, that PO1 cohort, uh, continued active surveillance when Sanofi stopped stopped it. So there's this continuous active surveillance in that, uh, that group. Uh, and then there's uh, a uh, University of Phil uh, uh, Philippines Manila uh, cohort in Cebu in which there were 3,000 kids that were uh, enrolled and had baseline serum samples drawn right before Dengvaxia program was initiated just a couple of months after that cohort was started. And about half of that cohort ended up uh, being vaccinated. And then a few months later, uh, Philippines suspended vaccinations. But that cohort is currently undergoing uh, surveillance also. So there's some clinically relevant samples uh, there. And then, as mentioned, the Bukandan Takeda uh, uh, phase three and uh, phase two slash three trials, um, respectively. And then uh, I've mentioned the control human infection models. There's two uh, human infection models. One is uh, the one developed uh, by NIH and uh, Johns Hopkins that has been actively used, that uses the attenuated uh, uh, strains, uh, uh, originally Dengue 2 and now uh, Dengue, uh, I th Dengue 3, I believe, right, yeah. Uh, and then uh, Walter Reed uh, developed uh, way back uh, a symptomatic infection model in which the recipients of the infection uh, challenge uh, became febrile or had other signs and symptoms. And so they reinitiated that a few years ago with some of the, uh, the questions that arose. And so with uh, those two models, those both can be used in different actual niches, I think, uh, to downselect and do proof of concept. Uh, and with all of these uh, different studies and with all of uh, the potential pursuit of correlates that's happening, a broadly coordinated harmonized effort would be great. Uh, quite difficult, but it would be great. But even with that, it's likely that uh, these correlates will be different based on vaccine and, 
assay. So those have to be used with some caution, but a, a coordinated effort, I think, uh, would be extremely helpful for the field. Um, I'm kind of going to skip this because I know that there's, there's new approaches, but really for now, current, the current pipeline is what we need to work on and to optimize either as public health tools or at least to advance the sci scientific knowledge uh, to accelerate the overall dengue vaccine uh, field. So in conclusion, dengue vaccine fortunately is possible but challenging because of the four serotypes. Sanofi's CYD TDV had mixed safety and efficacy results. There's likely an overall public health benefit, but that's been hampered by the concerns about the safety issues. Uh, fortunately, optimistically, there's been important lessons for the second generation vaccines that they've already incorporated and continue to incorporate. And most importantly, I think the performance of these two live attenuated vaccines currently in phase three trials, it'll be critical to how the overall field advances. And so with that, I thank you.